Over the course of time, spanning the first three centuries, the early church would face much opposition threatening her existence. However, one of the greatest threats would come not from without, but from within. And amongst these, perhaps the greatest would come from none other than that of Gnosticism. Now to really fully understand what exactly Gnosticism is, it is important that we first understand it in relationship to another view that we discussed in the previous video, Docetism. Now, Docetism in and of itself is not a full-blown worldview so much as a particular characteristic found within a worldview. That is, one would not find Docetism in isolation by itself. More specifically, this characteristic of Docetism was a characteristic that would come to be adopted by Gnostics in later years. In fact, one might even say that Docetism later developed and evolved into what would become known as Gnosticism. That is, Gnosticism could be thought of as Docetism 2.0. However, while Docetism itself only entails one part of Gnosticism, it nevertheless serves as one of the most vital components to the Gnostic worldview. That is, docetism is to Gnosticism what an engine is to a car, and that while an engine in and of itself cannot get one from A to B, it serves as a necessary part required of any given vehicle. In other words, while one can be docetic without Gnosticism, one cannot be Gnostic without docetism. For docetism, like an engine, is the very heartbeat of Gnosticism. Now, like Docetism, Gnosticism could not be described as an organized religion like, say, Judaism or Christianity or Islam. Rather, Gnosticism is a philosophy that would later manifest itself in various organized religious groups. And analogically speaking, one way to understand the relationship between Gnosticism as a philosophy and many of the organized religious groups that adopted it could be compared to the relationship between the philosophy of Marxism and many of the nation states that later adopted this philosophy. For while Marxism did not take hold within an organized political state until the 20th century, it nevertheless existed as a popular philosophy circulating throughout much of the late 19th century. And in a very similar way, while Gnosticism did not form into organized religious groups until some ways into the second century, it nevertheless existed as a powerful philosophy throughout much of the later first century. In fact, we see hints of what perhaps could be Docetic slash Gnostic philosophy at work and some of the later writings of the Apostle John in the late 1st century. To complicate matters even further, within the worldview of Gnosticism itself are numerous versions. In fact, there are probably about as many versions of Gnosticism as there are species of fish. Therefore, it is possible that what initially started as the heresy of Docetism within the Church later developed into a more full-blown philosophy of Gnosticism, which in turn developed into various organized groups adhering to this philosophy, each containing their own version of it. Nevertheless, at the very core of this movement lay a Docetic element. So then, what exactly was this characteristic that defined Docetism? Well, as we discussed in the previous video, the crux of Docetism rests on the rejection of the suffering Jesus on the cross. For as the Docetists claimed, Jesus did not die or suffer, but rather appeared to do so. Which really leads us to another question as to the drive behind this element. Why reject the suffering and death of Jesus? The answer, however, is much deeper than merely a simple rejection of his death, but rather a full rejection of his incarnation altogether. But then this leads us to yet another question as to why they rejected his incarnation. Well, to get an adequate explanation to this question, 
we really have to first look at the Gnostics' understanding of reality. The Gnostics believed that the whole cosmos could be divided into two main divisions, that which was spiritual and that which was material, and that all things, whether they be plants, animals, humans, rocks, mountains, clouds, whatever, existed somewhere along a spectrum between these two divisions. The Gnostics concluded that the more sentient a creature appeared, the more spiritual. Consequently, the less sentient one was, the less spiritual. And this is simply because the Gnostics believed that intellect and knowledge were equivalent to spirituality. In fact, this is where the Gnostics derive their name from the Greek word gnosis, meaning knowledge. Therefore, being that humans appear to be the most intelligent of all creatures within the visible universe, they must therefore be the most spiritual. However, on the opposite extreme, those things displaying no signs of rationality, such as stones or rocks, were believed to be entirely without spirit. And any other creature was placed somewhere along a spectrum between these two. That is, all things within the visible universe were something of a mix of both spirit and matter. So, for example, to get a little bit into specifics here, humans, for example, while consisting mostly of matter, nevertheless had a considerable sized spark of spirit within them. Likewise, animals of various sorts also contained a spark of spirit, but a bit smaller in size depending on the specific animal. And finally, plants, while almost entirely material in substance, nevertheless contain within themselves a very tiny spark of spirit. Following this logic, one could perhaps say that Gnostics viewed animation as a sign of rationality and consequently spirituality in a creature. Therefore, inanimate things, such as rocks or stones, would be considered a matter completely devoid of any form of spirit whatsoever. However, the Gnostic would say that the current state of affairs was not in fact the original design of the universe, but rather a degradation from a once more perfect reality. Now, before anything came into existence, there was spirit, to which the Gnostics gave various names, perhaps the most prominent of which being Proarche. While this Proarche was eternal, immortal, and most importantly, at least for the Gnostics, unknowable in his very being. And similar to how a sun naturally emits rays of light from it, from this very being emanated various other spirits called aeons. These aeons, in turn, also emanated various aeons of their own, which also emanated aeons of their own, and so on and so forth. Each subsequent level of aeons being inferior to the aeons from which they emanated. And in the same way that the rays of a sun become more and more dim as they move away from their source, so too do the aeons become less and less glorious and spiritual in relation to their source. Well, this totality of aeons inhabited a region known as the Pleroma. Now, like any communal living situation, the Pleroma had rules. And if there was effort to be peaceful harmony within the Pleroma, everyone had to abide by these rules. The most primary of which was not to seek out knowledge of those aeons higher up. Well, one of the lesser aeons, by the name of Sophia, who was something like the baby of the family of aeons, sought out to gain knowledge of this unknowable being, the eternal maker, the father of all existence, Proarche. Well, needless to say, she was unsuccessful in her efforts, and as a result of all this, the passions generated by her produced some, um stuff. What we might call spiritual aeonic dung. Now, being embarrassed by this and not wanting to get caught, Sophia quickly put a covering around this stuff so that nobody else would see it. 
Well, being that this stuff came from a living being, likewise contained within itself life. And being completely covered, this creature believed itself to be all that existed, and therefore sought to create a world of its own, with creatures of various sorts inhabiting this world. Amongst all these creatures, this being created yet another creature, distinct from all the others which he labeled man, of whom he proclaimed, Let us make him in our image and in our likeness. That is, this stuff, excreted from the aeons above, Gnostics referred to as the physical, visible universe, as we know it. That is, the visible universe is effectively the dung of higher spiritual aeons. And it is for this very reason that the Gnostics viewed this material world around us to be inferior to that of the spiritual. In other words, in contrast to Orthodox Christianity, which sees human sin and rebellion as the source of the fall, Gnosticism places the blame on the misaligned passions of higher spiritual beings. Moreover, what is termed the creation account, in fact simultaneously turns out to be the fall. This is in contrast to Orthodox Christianity, which presents to us a creation account, only later followed by a fall and consequent redemption. Well, in a similar fashion, the Gnostics also had a redemption story of their own. However, what Gnostics mean when they say redemption differs quite significantly from that of Orthodox Christianity. For the Gnostic, redemption is found not in transformation of moral character, but rather revelation of true knowledge. That is, it is not restoration of the heart, but restoration of the mind. More specifically, when the Gnostics speak of salvation, they mean from this world of illusory matter, both blinding as well as binding them from true reality. Now you might be wondering how these people came to find out all this information in the first place. Well, they would claim that it was revealed to them from above, that is, from the person of Christ. In fact, it is for this very reason why Christ came into the world, not to save man from his life of sin, but rather to impart knowledge to him, that is, knowledge of true reality. However, it was not to all that this knowledge was revealed, but only a select special few. Now, what can be Often very misleading are some of the terms Gnostics employed in their philosophy. And what I mean is that the Gnostics would often use virtually the same terminology as Orthodox Christians, but in a completely different respect. Case in point being with regards to the aforementioned term, salvation. However, we also see this in how they viewed the relationship between God the Father and Christ the Son. So, for example, they would say that the maker of this world is indeed the God spoken of in the Old Testament, that is, the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, etc. However, when the Gnostics speak of Father, they refer not to the God of the Torah and the prophets, but rather a completely different God entirely. That is, the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament are not one and the same, but rather two radically different gods. And that the person of Christ came not from the God of this world, but from he who is above all things, pro arche. In fact, not only were these gods different from one another, but even opposed to one another. Now what is most interesting was that while all creatures of the physical created universe contained bits of spirit within them in varying proportions. Their maker, that is the God of the Old Testament, surprisingly enough, was entirely void of spirit. And therefore, because the God of this universe was material, he therefore likewise opposed all that was spiritual. And it is for this very reason that the true Father from above sent his Son into the world 
to save us from both this world as well as its creator. The Gnostics claimed that there would come a day when all physical matter would be destroyed and any spirit that had been embedded within this matter, aka within us, would be released and reunited with the spiritual aeons in the Pleroma, thus restoring harmony to the universe. Therefore, because the material universe was both deceptive and inferior, any things or activities associated with it, such as sexual activity or the eating of meat, were either completely avoided or fully embraced. Avoided by ascetic Gnostics desiring to be more and more connected with the spiritual world and disconnected with this one, embraced by those Gnostics who believed that such activities had no effect whatsoever on their spirits, since this body of theirs would inevitably be purged from them anyway. In light of all this, we can now begin to understand, a little more at least, why the Gnostics would completely reject the incarnation of Jesus, simply because such an idea went completely against the very essence of their belief system. For why would a spiritual god take on evil physical substance? However, ironically enough, that which was seen by the Gnostics as degrading was upheld by Orthodox Christians in highest esteem. For according to Orthodox Christianity, it is by this very physical flesh and blood of Jesus Christ that God redeems man back to himself. And not merely redeemed in the spiritual sense alone, but also resurrected to life in the physical sense as well. For unlike the Gnostics, who long for the day of liberation from this prison, which they called the body, Orthodox Christians longed for the day when they would again receive resurrected bodies anew. And therefore, because Gnosticism rejected one of the most central tenets of the Christian faith, it would consequently itself also be rejected by the Church. I invite all questions and comments in the discussion section, so please feel free to write or ask any questions below. Thanks.